Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the intersectionality between, excuse me, yeah. obesity, cancer, and basic translational health disparities research. My name is Mabinti Conte and I will be your WebEx technical support host. Before we dive into today's meeting, I wanted to provide some quick information on the webinar platform. All lines have been muted on entry and will remain muted for the duration of the webinar. Please submit questions throughout the presentation using the chat or Q&A box and select all panelists. A moderator will ask your comments and or questions on your behalf at the end of the presentation. If you require technical assistance, please feel free to contact Jenny Tweston, the host, via the chat panel, and she'd be happy to assist you. Closed captioning is available and a link has been provided in the chat box. We also wanted to make you aware that today's webinar is being recorded. As I am sharing my screen, please make sure you move your mouse away from the top that says Ving application so you can see the entire screen. And with that, I would now like to turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. Anil Wally. Thanks, Mabinti. Um, I would like to welcome um, each and every one here. I'm seeing almost 250 people have logged in. So my name is Anil Wali. I'm the program director at the NCI's Center to Reduce Cancer Health Disparities. And um, on behalf of our Trans NCI work group and the planning committee, um, we would like to welcome you all to this uh, second session of this four part webinar series on intersectionality of finding obesity, cancer and basic translational health disparities research. Uh, so here uh, we have a stellar line of uh, investigators um, as our panelists and speakers and who will try to provide an overview uh, of the intersectionality among these three aspects and um, the next one, um, Mabinti, um, this is a sneak preview of the uh, line of uh, speakers and panelists for the session and the title of the talks. And uh, at this stage, um, I would like to introduce um, Dr. John Carruthers, um, who is the discussant for the session. It's my truly honor and pleasure to be introducing Dr. Carruthers, uh, who is John G. Surly Professor and Chair, Department of Internal Medicine. He is Professor of Human Genetics, University of uh, Michigan School of Medicine. Uh, he is a world-renowned gastroenterologist, and his area of uh, research um, is on um, hereditary colorectal cancer and cancer health disparities. And uh, he will be setting the stage for this uh, session and um, we'll be introducing the um, line of distinguished uh, speakers. So without any further ado, Dr. Carruthers, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Wally, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, as Dr. Wally said, my name is John Carruthers. I'm at the University of Michigan, and I would like to give you just a primer uh, ahead of our three uh, speakers uh, for today. So can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so you've heard the title today, and as I mentioned, my name is John Carruthers. Next slide, please. I have no disclosures. Next slide. So we know that cancer is a genetic disease, but in really, it's it's that's the end result. There are a lot of things that can go into developing cancer, and it's really an environmental gene environmental interaction. You can take anyone who is susceptible, who might have the right genetic makeup to predispose to cancer, expose them to something in the environment, and then uh, that environment can enhance the types of cancers um, that they can develop. Uh, we know about viruses, we know about UV light and uh, skin cancers, and we know a lot about the detriments of tobacco on multiple cancers. But one of the things that uh, our environment does is change is is from what we eat. For instance, there are several cancers associated with high fat diet. These things uh, that change our metabolic makeup. And one result of that is the type of inflammation 
that is a result from that constant lifelong uh, high fat uh, diet. So even innate inflammation and inflammation uh, from a high fat diet can predispose one to a number of different uh, cancers. Next slide, please. So looking at some of the trends just for two cancers, and I'm a gastroenterologist, so I picked colorectal cancer and gastric cancer in this case. And looking at the trends, um, we see that uh, screening, particularly for colorectal cancer, has reduced um, the incidence of colon cancer over time. These trends are apparent for those age 50 and older. Interestingly, shown in this middle bar graph where the red arrow is, those under the age of 50 is the only group that the trends have increased, okay? And similarly, for gastric cancer, because of changes in uh, our health over time, even though we don't screen for gastric cancer in the United States, but other changes in our health have led to the reduction of gastric cancer since, since the early 1900s in the United States. But again, looking at the bar graph to the right of the line graph, except for those under the age of 50. Please show the next slide. And this is interestingly broken out by those with obesity versus those without obesity. So looking at panel A, this is colorectal cancer, adults with obesity, you see that for all age groups, the colors are the same as the previous slide, from those under age 50, 50 to 65, 65 and older, and 75 and older, all have been increasing. Now, if you look to panel B, colorectal cancer trends for adults without obesity, the trends show they're all dropping, meaning that obesity seems to be um, one subcategory of uh, patients in which the rate of colorectal cancer trends are growing. Similarly, for gastric cancer, in adults with obesity, most of the lines are uh, aiming uh, up. And if you look at the bar graph to the right, they're all above zero, so those trends are rising. But for those, for gastric cancer in adults without obesity, um, the trends are dropping. So again, for these two diseases that I show you, uh, uh, the, the presence of obesity seems to be enhancing the trends for the onset of these cancers compared to those adults without obesity. Next slide, please. Now, um, it's very interesting because what really drives uh, cancer and other comorbid diseases in humans? And certainly in the United States, um, there is uh, great evidence for pointing towards the initiation of socioeconomic inequality. And when you have low socioeconomic status, you tend to have a lower level of education. That's not 100%, but you tend to. And that has downstream consequences. Where you live, do you live in a neighborhood without grocery stores? Do you live in a neighborhood without parks? Does that change the type of diet that you have? High fat, high caloric type diets, access to corner party stores instead of corner grocery stores, and increased use of tobacco and alcohol, and with limited uh, access to parks and playgrounds, you might have lower physical activity. And it also may um, affect the type of health care in the neighborhood that's available. Ultimately, and this spans over a lifetime, that leads to physiologic consequences. But in, in the GI tract and in the pulmonary tract, it can change your uh, microbiome. Um, it can lead to increased localized inflammation and compromised immunity. And then that sets up the environment for you to develop cancer. And other metabolic diseases, such as obesity, diabetes, asthma, and others. And so this is uh, over a lifetime, as I show in this triangle showing older age to the right. It's fascinating that these exact same conditions were the same setup for high risk for COVID-19 severity. And so there, I don't think there's any mistake that these, uh, the triggers from social and economic equality lead to these things that affect a lot of our chronic diseases and in the more recent time uh, affects the way we get an acute infectious disease. Next slide, please. Um, this is also some uh, 
back up one, please. This is also summarized in comparing cancer to COVID-19. Um, we know cancer is a series of genetic diseases, has local environmental influences, as I mentioned, and its onset is over a long period of time. Whereas COVID-19 on the right is an infectious diseases, has local environmental influences based on the types of receptors that the virus uses to enter the body, and um, uh, has onset over hours to days. But if you look at the things that are common to both, uh, the socioeconomic uh, disparity I mentioned, but really many of them, uh, both of these have common lifestyle factors and comorbidities such as use of tobacco and its related diseases, use of alcohol and its related diseases, and ultimately metabolic dysfunction from the type of diet and obesity. Next slide. And there are several ways to mitigate these. Um, and I'm not gonna go into this extensively, but I just wanna highlight some of the light blue uh, uh, wording here. Uh, under cancer, uh, aggressive cancer screening programs might be able to mitigate uh, some of the uh, dis, um, differences, particularly between groups. Um, uh, uh, in, in communities that have been hit hard, particularly by COVID-19, try to protect cancer disparity research projects and outreach, uh, and also um, uh, the ability for cancer-related advocacy organizations to provide community engagement activities. Um, so leveraging community engagement and patient navigator networks to ensure diverse accrual into testing, as well as guidance for getting screening is often a great equalizer. Next slide, please. So I want to give you that a general background as we hear from our three uh, distinguished speakers and panels today. Um, the first speaker will be Dr. Victoria Seawatt, who's the Ruth Ziegler Professor and Chair and Associate Director of City of Hope uh, the Comprehensive Cancer Center, who will talk to us on insulin and biologically aggressive breast cancer impacting our communities. Dr. Lucio Miele, uh, who's the Cancer Crusaders Professor and Chair of the Department of Genetics and the Assistant Dean for Translational Science at LSU, will talk to us about obesity, diabetes, and aggressive breast cancer, socioeconomics meets biology. And Dr. Augusto Choa, who's the director of the Scott Cancer Center and the L. Copeland Cancer Crusaders Chair in Cancer Research and Professor of Pediatrics at LSU, will talk to us about obesity primes chronic inflammatory cells that promote cancer. And I'm thrilled to be a partner with Dr. Anil Wally, who introduced this session today. So I, next slide, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Victoria Seawald to hear her talk on insulin and aggressive breast cancer biology. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you so much, John, and thank you, Dr. Wally. I, it is a pleasure to be here um, and also welcome to my home. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about insulin, insulin resistance and biologically aggressive breast cancer. Next, please. So the United States is a very rich country and Los Angeles where I live is a very rich city, but that wealth is not distributed equally. We have many places in all of our cities across the United States where people don't have access to some of the real basic necessities. As John alluded to, there's a lack of access to healthy foods, to medical care, and also to the ability to be able to go outside in a safe environment. And we see this very clearly in Los Angeles. Um, these areas are called food deserts, and so they're characterized by poverty, liquor stores, fast food, and also a great deal of pollution. And so in these areas, which are um, labeled in orange in, in Los Angeles, um, we see an increased incidence of diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. Next slide. Now, in the past, diabetes, insulin, and breast cancer were all considered to be very different disciplines, and the diabetes folks didn't even bother to talk to the cancer folks. We, we never interacted. We never thought that each of us had an impact on the other. Here I'm gonna talk about insulin resistance, insulin and breast cancer, and then I'm gonna talk about how insulin may be driving aggressive breast cancer biology. Next, please. So 
First of all, I want to just talk about insulin resistance because this is a really important concept. So normally when people eat, your glucose goes up and your insulin goes up. And then the glucose goes into your muscle cells, which are the primary glucose burning cells, and the insulin comes down. Next. In diabetes, type 2 diabetes, what happens is that your insulin needs are outstripped and glucose starts to rise. Eventually, this starts to burn out the pancreas and type 2 diabetes starts to look a lot like type 1 diabetes. Next, please. Now, there's an intermediate condition called insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia, which I think is really important for cancer. And in this situation, glucose will go up and down pretty normally, but the amount of insulin that's required to go get the glucose into the muscle cells is extraordinarily high. And insulin is a hormone that stimulates hunger. It promotes the transformation of carbohydrate to fat, and it prevents fat access. So what we misappropriately label as lack of willpower, and we say, oh, that person has no willpower. What this really is, is biology, because once you get these high insulin levels, you become ravenously hungry. And while you may eat a limited diet, everything that you're eating is turning to fat and you're not able to access it. Next, please. We also make people unhealthy when they're treated for cancer. And this was a study that came out of City of Hope from Leslie Bernstein and Joan Mortimer. And these are women who had early stage breast cancer who received cytotoxic chemotherapy. And as you can see in the bar, women started out with a normal hemoglobin A1C. So that's a measure of average glucose for the last three months. But after chemotherapy, they became insulin resistant. And it's very common for women to come into their medical oncologist and say, I can't lose weight. And the medical oncologist, somebody like me goes, well, what's your problem? You're alive, just get over it. But I'd like to maintain that this is actually an important problem. Next, please. Because when you have these elevated levels of insulin, insulin stimulates just about every pathway that's involved in biologically aggressive cancer. And it could be breast cancer, but there are a lot of other cancers such as GI cancers and lung cancers that are also driven by insulin downstream signaling pathways such as AKT mTOR, went beta catenin, ECH2, NOTCH, MYC, and STAT3. Next. Now, there have been a lot of studies looking at the interrelationship between obesity and triple negative breast cancer, particularly in women who self-identify as Black or African American. And you would think that there would be a very easy link. Obesity, high insulin, biologically aggressive breast cancer, what's the problem? The problem is that the, the results from these studies have been horribly confusing, and a lot of times they've had conflicting results. One of the problems with these very well designed studies is that they consider um, obesity as BMI greater than 30 and as a yes no variable, so a biphasic variable. Next. The problem is not everybody's the same, and using a um, non Hispanic European uh, centric viewpoint on BMI doesn't work for the rest of the world. So what I'm showing here is a graph. And if you look under the red bar down at the bottom, you see non-Hispanic white. And at a BMI of 30, approximately 10% of non-Hispanic whites are diabetic. But if women are uh, South African, Asian, Black, you have the same frequency of um, diabetes at way lower BMIs. So if you gauge your study as BMI greater or uh, less than 30, what happens is for non-Hispanic whites, it works out pretty well, but for the rest of the population of the, you know, of the world, it's not a very good measure. Next slide. So, the other thing that's really important is that there's individual variation. And I'm gonna show you the example of myself and my husband, Eric. Eric used to be a marathon runner and you know, 
we had a kid and things didn't go so well after that. So Eric gained a lot of weight. Um, he is 350 pounds. He has a very high BMI diet, not very good, very little exercise. You got me over here. Okay. Lady exercise freak. Um, I eat a low carb vegetarian diet. I swim and I run, you know, I'm exercising 90 minutes a day. So the question is, which of the two of us is going to be pre-diabetic and have problems with their triglycerides? Okay, next. Well, you'd bet your bottom dollar it was going to be Eric and not me, but life isn't always fair. And this is to illustrate the radical variation that there can be in people. People can be um, have a high BMI, but be metabolically healthy, such as Eric, who has a hemoglobin A1C and a cholesterol of a 10 year old and me, who, despite all kinds of stuff is not doing very well. Um, next, please. 1 possibility is that I take a statin and statins in some individuals have been shown to cause diabetes. So that might be the cause here. Um, another possibility is as we start to look at genetic admixture, we start to realize that there's quite a bit of diversity that's possible. And I also have Asian ancestry. So it may be that there's some sort of interaction between my German, Eastern Europe and Asian ancestry in configuring this problem. So again, we need to do further studies. Next, please. Okay. Next. Okay, so we started to look at signaling pathways that might be initiated before individuals develop cancer. And in particular, we looked at the contralateral breasts in women who developed ipsilateral triple negative breast cancers. And so this is in uh, 40 women who self-identified as either black or African-American. And what we observed is that in the non-cancerous cells, we saw activation of beta catenin, bimentin, a lot of mTOR signaling pathways. And this occurred primarily in women who had high BMI. Next. We looked in, we performed tissue mapping in women who went for prophylactic mastectomies. And again, we were able to find evidence of Wnt and downstream H M GA2 and EZH2. So went network signaling in the normal tissue. And this is part of an ongoing national trial. Next, please. Wnt is very important. And Wnt is something along with its downstream beta catenin, HMGA2 and EZH2 predicts biologically uh, poor prognosis, triple negative breast cancer. So in the box on the upper right, it risk stratifies triple negative breast cancer into good and poor prognosis. We've also found that in mouse models of triple negative breast cancer that knockout of either one of these signaling proteins results in delay in carcinogenesis. Next, please. This whole issue of wind signaling is quite important to us because triple negative breast cancer, particularly in women who self-identify as black or African-American is associated with early onset pregnancy. In a separate study, we started to look at mammary gland remodeling during pregnancy, lactation, and involution. And what we found is that during pregnancy, what happens is our fat cells start to delipify and dedifferentiate. And then in involution, they go, they undergo the reverse. They redifferentiate and they relipify. Next, please. But if Win 10 b is high, this process of differentiation is blocked. Next. So currently we have a national trial ongoing and we're pretty close to finishing accrual where we're looking in women who are at high risk for breast cancer and have um, early changes in the breast, whether if we lower insulin signaling and inhibit AKTM TOR, um, using metformin, whether this results in a uh, reversal of uh, pre malignant uh, changes in the breast. And we're excited about this because we're able to get cells from the breast before and after 
uh, the treatment with either metformin or placebo. So this is ongoing and we'll be very interested in seeing our results. Next slide. So BMI does not, in our opinion, adequately predict metabolic um, health. And I think we need to look deeper than just measuring somebody's weight and height. People are not one size fits all. We need to also think about early evidence of aggressive biology, particularly things that might be stimulated by insulin. And particularly in cancer survivors, we don't just discard their um, weight gain as, oh, so what? We really need to treat women when they have um, insulin resistance. So future directions, we're excited about completing our metformin trial. Next slide. And I wanna thank all our young investigators who have helped us with these studies and have gone on to medical school. They have done an amazing job. Next. And I also want to thank the women who are involved in uh, these studies and have donated their tissue. Um, one of my, uh, the women who donated her tissue said that I needed to go and say this every time I speak and I've been faithful to her. She said, you know, sometimes you have a bad day and you look around you and you don't think that anything you've done really matters. But to please tell people that everything that they do counts and to please keep on working and you're all part of the answer for people like herself. So she wanted to say thank you to everybody and thank you for this opportunity to speak. <laughs> Dr. Seawalt, Se that was fantastic. Uh, I'm I'm uh, very impressed. I'm sure you're gonna get uh, some wonderful questions on that presentation. <clears throat> it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Lucio Miele from LSU Health Sciences Center. Um, um, he will speak today on obesity, diabetes, and aggressive breast cancer. Socioeconomics needs biology. Dr. Miele. Thank you so much. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? So what we're gonna talk about today is four studies uh, at the population level of which one has been published uh, and the other three are uh, ongoing. So I will share with you a, a reasonable amount of unpublished data. Uh, next, please. Uh, we work in Louisiana and Louisiana is unfortunately a hotspot for breast cancer mortality along with the District of Columbia. Uh, our disparity is in mortality is almost entirely due to higher mortality among African Americans. Uh, last time we checked, we had the highest incidence of triple negative breast cancer uh, in the country, particularly the New Orleans area. Uh, overweight status and obesity are highly prevalent among our triple negative breast cancer patients. Uh, 86% of our African-American patients and 67% of our European-American patients are either overweight or obese. 58% of our African-American patients and 36% of European-Americans are clinically obese. Next, please. So the questions that, that, were, that our team is asking is, what are the roles of biological and environmental uh, and socioeconomic factors in determining these disparities in breast cancer mortality, as well as incidence in the Deep South, using New Orleans as, as, a, uh, as an example, and are obesity and or diabetes associated with breast cancer risk and or distinctive breast cancer biology. Next, please. So the first study, uh, which is published, uh, looked at social determinants of health and triple negative breast cancer. Uh, we took three years of data from the Louisiana Tumor Registry, and we looked at age, sex, race, ethnicity, address, and a variety of clinical pathological characteristics abstracted from um, electronic health records. We geocoded socioeconomic variables according to 2010 census, uh, and um, we used the geocoding interface environment used by uh, state cancer registries. Next, please. Uh, socioeconomics data were from the American census, uh, uh, US census, and we calculated one of several measures of uh, 
socioeconomic disadvantage, the concentrated neighborhood disadvantage index. Uh, this is not the only tool available. We use this one in, in this particular case because it includes a measure of uh, residential segregation. Next, please. So not surprising and consistent with a fairly large amount of literature, uh, there is a uh, difference in incidence of triple negative breast cancers between people who identify as black or African American and people who identify as white or European Americans throughout the lifespan, beginning in the 30s. Next. Now, this is the distribution of concentrated disadvantage index. Uh, as you can see, while there is overlap, now, uh, going to your left in the graph is uh, more affluent neighborhoods and to your right is less affluent neighborhoods. Now, as you can see, there is overlap, but as we move towards less affluent neighborhoods, the fraction of African-American households increased dramatically and at the highest levels of disadvantage, it's almost exclusively African-American households. Next, please. Uh, this uh, is stage of diagnosis. And the reason why I have a purple uh, rectangle around the, the bar uh, uh, to your right uh, is that that explains a large fraction of, of the difference in mortality. As you can see, these are young women aged 30 to 39, 16% of whom are diagnosed already with distant metastasis, uh, which in the majority of cases is not curable, and half of them have no positive disease at diagnosis. This is earlier than the earliest age at which mammography is recommended. So screening is not going to correct this disparity. And if you look to the left uh, at their European American counterparts, the number diagnosed in the earliest stage group uh, where distant metastasis is zero. So we have tumors that progress very rapidly in young women, and it is entirely consistent with what you heard uh, earlier from Dr. Sewell about the role of insulin and um, pregnancy. Next. Uh, not surprisingly, mortality changes with stage of diagnosis for both uh, uh, African Americans uh, and Caucasians in a, in a way that is uh, consistent with distant and regional spread being associated with higher mortality. Next. Now, when we corrected for concentrated disadvantage index, uh, there was no, no significant change uh, uh, for every standard de uh, um, deviation in CDI. In other words, the risk of incidence among African Americans is not explained by uh, a concentrated disadvantage index. Next. But concentrated disadvantage index does explain differences in stage of diagnosis, as you can see here. There's a 20% increase in the odds ratio for every standard deviation increase in, in CDI and next. CDI does explain differences in mortality. It's almost identical. There's a 19% increase in uh, odds ratio for every standard deviation increase in concentrated disadvantage. Next. So what we can conclude uh, from this study is that consistent with the literature, African-American women in, in Louisiana had a, a 2.21 times higher incidence of triple negative breast cancer compared to their European-American counterparts. And this was independent of neighborhood CDI. Uh, African-American women, however, were more likely to be diagnosed at later stages and to die of their diseases. And both these disparities were in fact explained by concentrated disadvantage index. So our results suggest 
the neighborhood disadvantage does contribute to racial disparities in both stage of diagnosis and survival among triple negative breast cancer patients in Louisiana, but not necessarily to disparities in incidence. Next, please. So what accounts for the differences in incidence? Is it obesity or dysmetabolism? Is it immunity? Why is the age distribution of that stage of diagnosis different? Uh, do social determinants of health affect cancer progression rates through a variety of genomic, epigenetic, or immunological mechanisms? We're uh, trying to address these questions uh, as we speak. Next, please. Now, the second study is uh, confirms what uh, Dr. Siebel just told you. Uh, we examine BMI, knowing that this is an imperfect measure of obesity, but when you're doing large population studies uh, using EHR-derived data, it's often all you have. Uh, and uh, we, deter we, we um, try to ask whether or not BMI is associated with worse outcomes in Louisiana triple negative breast cancer. Next. As you can see here, uh, uh, and I told you earlier, the fraction of uh, obese women uh, with BMI over 30 is much higher among our African-American patients than it is among our European-American patients. Next. Uh, again, we confirmed that uh, this is six years worth of data, that stage of diagnosis is significantly different as we saw in the previous study. Next. However, BMI did not predict survival, consistent with what you heard earlier from Dr. Siebel, stage of diagnosis data. Next. Same thing for age diagnosis, young age diagnosis, but again, not BMI predicted survival. Next. Uh, this is just a reminder of what you've already heard in, in, in the first uh, presentation that the literature on the association of BMI with outcomes in triple negative breast cancer is confusing at best for the reasons that Dr. Seawalt explained. Next. So stage of diagnosis remains significantly different, but BMI is not associated with worse outcomes. We have not yet investigated whether diabetes is associated with worse outcomes. And that's where we're going next. Next. So more open questions. Is obesity associated with unique breast cancer gene expression profiles and or immune microenvironments? Uh, are obesity and or diabetes associated with differences in incidence of breast cancer? Next. Uh, the study I'm going to summarize now is supported by uh, an NCI pre-sport P20 that uh, uh, Augusto and I share, uh, and this is project one. I'm not going to read you the specific aims, but basically the question is what I, what I just told you. Uh, are there differences in the genomic portraits, in the transcriptomic portraits of these tumors among uh, uh, between African American and Caucasian women and between obese women and non obese women? Next. Uh, these are the eligibility criteria for the study. Uh, it's essentially anybody with triple negative breast cancer at any stage. Uh, and we did need to know whether the patients had received neoadjuvant chemotherapy because that, of course, affects uh, body mass, but also because we have a second aim where we're looking at pre and post neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Next. This is the workflow of the study. Uh, the Louisiana Tumor Registry requests archival specimens from all hospitals in Louisiana. These are QC'd by our study pathologist. Uh, then they are uh, cataloged in my laboratory. They are sent to the translational genomics core directed by Dr. Zabaleta. Uh, they are uh, RNA extracted, QC'd, RNA-seq, DNA is also extracted and kept for future studies. Uh, and then 
uh, bioinformatics and biostatistical analytics follow. Next. Now, this is preliminary. We have now sequenced over 300 of these patients. These are the results uh, of the first 48. So please take this with a grain of salt. Uh, but as you can see, there is clustering to a point. Uh, uh, and I apologize with, for the red and green in this heat map. That's that's what the program uh, produced uh, for publication purposes. We'll change the color scheme. Uh, there is a group of Caucasian Americans that have transcriptional profiles distinctly different from other Caucasians and from African Americans. Uh, and the most different genes were related to inflammation interleukin 17 uh, uh, and its pathway were particularly uh, different, which is of great interest as you will hear in the next presentation, uh, as well as genes uh, uh, tied to metabolism. Uh, glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, for example, carbohydrate digestion and absorption. This is all consistent with the notion that these differences in transcriptomics that we're seeing are, are tied to either metabolism or immunity and possibly both. Next. Again, uh, whoops, one back. Thank you. Uh, as you can see here, tumors occurring in obese patients do segregate from tumors occurring in lean patients, but there are at least two subtypes of tumors occurring in lean patients. And the tumors occurring in obese patients are also simi more similar to each other, but there is heterogeneity there. Next. Again, cytokines and chemokines and, and uh, 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 immune um, associated pathways were among the most different uh, between these two groups. Next. So, having told you that BMI is far from perfect to measure metabolic fitness, uh, we expanded our population study looking at the relationship between BMI, diabetes, and breast cancer incidence in Louisiana. In this case, we used the case control design and we expanded our investigation to all major subtypes rather than just triple negative, which is what I've shown you so far. Initially, the idea was to use the other subtypes as control. Uh, we, we expected to see differences only in triple negative breast cancer. Uh, that's not what we observed. Next. Again, uh, uh, location southeastern Louisiana. These are the inclusion criteria. Uh, and these are the numbers of cases of luminal A, luminal B, HER2 enriched and triple negative among the cases. And next, uh, controls uh, had one or more encounters in our healthcare system during the study period. They had, they had to have valid EHR and DMI data. They were age matched uh, and race matched at a rate of five controls per case. And exposures were, con were considered obesity in four categories of BMI or diabetes, all ICD-9 codes. ICD-9 because these data end at um, 2015. Okay, very quickly, next. Next. Uh, Diabetes was much more associated to incidence of, the, of these tumors, in this case, control design, than obesity, not only for triple negative, but for all subtypes of cancer. Next. Uh, in conclusion, uh, stage and air diagnosis, but not BMI, are associated with poor survival. However, tumors occurring in obese patients are molecularly distinct from tumors uh, that occur in lean patients and may include multiple subgroups. Uh, I've shown you what genes are enriched, and interestingly, diabetes is associated with all subtypes of breast cancer, suggesting immune and or metabolic mechanisms. Next. And I would like to conclude by thanking uh, Augusto Cho and Fokulo Sen uh, uh, from the uh, Stanley Scott Cancer Center, uh, of course, Dr. Seawalt, 
uh, Denise Danos uh, biostatistician, Chindo Hicks bioinformatician, and Drs. Wu and Lynch from the Louisiana Tumor Registry. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Miele. That was wonderful. And uh, I know you're going to get a lot of questions on some of those uh, wonderful studies you just performed. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Augusto Ochoa, also from Louisiana State University. As I mentioned, he's the director of the Scott uh, Cancer Center and uh, 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 involved in cancer research and a professor of pediatrics. Dr. Ochoa, you have the floor. Thank you, John, and thank you, Anil, for inviting me to this very interesting uh, present set of presentations. I'd like to talk uh, a little bit about uh, obesity and chronic inflammation and, and how that might play a role in promoting cancer. Next slide. You've heard already of the complexity of obesity and how it affects not only the tumor cells itself, but how genetics uh, plays an important role in how obesity promotes the development of uh, diseases like cancer and other diseases associated with inflammation. But because of the relationship of inflammation in this whole process, there's been a very significant increase in interest in metabolism and the immune system. Not only an, under, an interest in how the intrinsic metabolic function of immune cells affects their functions per se, but how the metabolic microenvironment, in this case obesity, affects the function of inflammatory cells. Next slide. It's well known from work that uh, Robert Schreiber did about a decade ago, a little bit more than a decade ago, that um, as cells become malignant, uh, there is a sur immune surveillance mechanism that keeps them under control and eliminates practically the whole tumor. But eventually some of these tumor cells will escape not only because they develop enough mutations that they are not recognized by the immune cells, but also because the tumor cells themselves uh, promote the development of an inflammatory infiltrate primarily by myeloid cells rather than lymphoid cells. And these myeloid cells shown here produce a series of factors uh, to your right, produce a series of factors like IDO, IL-10, INOS, and arginase that block the function of this immunosurveillance mechanisms, and therefore tumors can start growing. Next slide. So what evidence do we have of this? And this is very clear if one looks at certain tumors that are rapidly progressing, in this case, an immunohistology of, a, of colorectal cancer. One can see in the first column to the left that there's an increase in the, in the epithelial malignant cells. The second column shows the increase in the myeloid cells in this particular case, macrophages marked by CD11B. That is the second largest subpopulation of cells that you can see infiltrating that colorectal cancer. And at the end, in the right-hand side, you see an increase in fibroblast. But if you one looks at the middle at both the CD4 and the CD8 T cells, there is a lack of these cells present in the tumors. And therefore, this immune surveillance mechanism that once controlled the initiation of cancer is not there anymore. Next slide. So what other evidence do we have that this is associated with uh, obesity at all? There's indirect evidence from studies in bariatric surgery. This is a very large study conducted by Danny Schauer uh, from Kaiser Permanente, where he looked retrospectively at over 80,000 people who had uh, were considered to be obese 22,000 of these underwent bariatric surgery and they were followed for at least 10 years. And one can see in the left-hand side graph that those individuals who underwent bariatric surgery had uh, better outcomes and better cancer-free survival than those who did not have uh, bariatric surgery. This, was, uh, this difference was maintained, especially in obesity-associated cancers, but became less evident in cancers that were not associated with obesity. Next slide. But what markers or what information do we have at the more uh, microscopic level? This is work that was started for many years ago by Andy Dannenberg in Memorial Sloan Kettering. And this particular publication from Emory University shows that the um, adipose tissue surrounding breast cancer is infiltrated by these myeloid cells in these structures that are called crown-like structures. 
But the new information that is shown in this recent publication is that these numbers of the crown light structures increases with the BMI as shown in the middle uh, graph in the bottom of this uh, uh, slide. Next slide. Now, we decided to study something a little bit different from the traditional macrophage population. It's well known that in, uh, that in normal adipose tissue or in early adiposity, there's an infiltration by macrophages, mostly called M2 or anti-inflammatory macrophages on your left-hand side. But as adiposity increases, there's an increase in the production of inflammatory cytokines, TNF, IL-6, and IL-1. And as adiposity continues, there is not only the production of these cytokines, but there's also an infiltration by these cells called myeloid-derived suppressor cells that now produce IL-4 arginase and impair the function of T cells and natural killer cells. Next slide. But what are my, what are MDSCs or what are myeloid-derived suppressor cells? These cells have been best studied in, in cancers, in the existing cancers, and it's been shown that malignancies impair the complete maturation of these uh, immature myeloid cells and therefore block their development into either granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, or basophils, or to monocytic cells. And therefore, they either morphologically become granulocytic or PMN myeloid-derived suppressor cells or monocytic MDSCs. Next slide. And they produce a series of factors, in this case, arginase-1, inos, and IDO, all of which impair the immune surveillance mechanisms by T cells and natural killer cells. Next slide. The role of MDSCs in obesity has been studied by several groups. However, the data has been somewhat contradictory. Here's an early study where they indeed showed that MDSCs were increased in mice, in obese mice, either genetically made obese or obese because of high fat diets. But in this case, the conclusion was that MDSC is protected from inflammation and insulin resistance. Next slide. In contrast, this other study shows that although there is an increase in, in MDSCs, but in this case, infiltrating livers, MDSCs caused liver damage and promoted the development of liver malignancies. Next slide. More recent work, again, coming from Memorial Sloan Kettering, in this case by Daniela Quayle, and work done by Susan Oster and Rosenberg at the University of Maryland showed that mice, obese mice, again, both genetically obese or induced by diet, uh, increased the number of granulocytic cells infiltrating different organs. In this particular case, and shown in that red box, is the infiltration of lungs by granulocytic cells. And to the right-hand side, it shows that these cells are now starting to express genes associated with the function and immunosuppressive function of myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Next slide. But what does that have to do with humans and, hum and, and humans with obesity? Um, a, a, a very successful independent investigator from our group, Dr. Maria Sanchez, in collaboration with Dr. Bill Richardson from the Oxford Medical Center, who's a bariatric surgeon, decided to ask a very simple question. What happens to these MDSCs in patients who have obesity that is significant enough that requires bariatric surgical intervention? Next slide. They studied about 55 to 60 patients. And as you can see in the right-hand uh, column of that table, the BMI of these individuals was significant, was over 40, 48.3. Um, while their non-obese controls were within below the 25 uh, BMI. The distribution of African Americans and European Americans was very similar, and the primary intervention was a sleeve gastrectomy rather than the ruin y gastric bypass. Next slide. The initial observation was very striking, and that was that if one looked at the granulocytic MDSCs in circulation in preoperative patients, the second, the, the second group of dots there, the black ones, one sees that there is a very significant increase in the number of circulating MDSEs. If one looks carefully, there are about two groups. The top group is about 10 times higher 
than the level seen in normal controls. And there is a bottom group that is within normal limits, suggesting that obese individuals might have two different categories, the inflamed or high MDSEs individuals and the ones that are within normal limits, even though all of them are within BMIs higher than 40. The second observation they made was, as you see there, that three, six, and 12 months after the surgery, the number of MDSEs rapidly declined. But if one isolated those MDSEs and looked at the expression of these factors that are able to suppress T cell function, like arginase, IDO, and nitric oxide synthase, these were not highly expressed in these cells, suggesting that these cells might not be very immunosuppressive. Next slide. Next slide. This is a spider plot following the same patients, and I just want to show this because it's interesting to see that if you look at three months, there were three individuals who had increases in the MDSCs instead of decreases in the MDSC, while everybody else had decrease. Those three individuals ended up having other pathologies associated with, with MDSC. One of them had a malignancy, the other one developed an autoimmune disease, and the third one developed a chronic infection. Next slide. Other immune subpopulations, monocytic MDSEs and T cells did not change significantly before or after bariatric surgery. Next slide. But if one looked at omental fat tissue that was removed during the bariatric surgery, one saw also a very dramatic infiltration of that omental fat tissue by these granulocytic MDSEs as compared to a mental fat from controlled uh, individuals who had surgeries not associated with obesity. Next slide. These individuals who underwent bariatric surgery, as expected, had weight loss and had decreases in BMI. But one, one thing that's important to note is that none of them, even at 12 months, achieved completely normal BMIs uh, may be related to one of the issues that Dr. Sewell brought up at the beginning. Next slide. What they did have was a relatively a relative decrease in the metabolic syndrome score, meaning some of the some of the issues associated with metabolic syndrome were improving in these individuals, and they did have a decrease in a non-specific marker of inflammation. In this case, C-reactive protein. Next slide. But probably the most interesting observation, next slide, was the fact that if one looked at the expression of lipid receptors in these granulocytic myeloid-derived suppressor cells, they were all increased, especially the receptors associated with the internalization of cholesterol. And if you can see, look at the um, Top left-hand corner is the receptor for LDL. The one on the right-hand side is LOX1. That is a receptor for oxidized LDL. And the bottom is CD36. And then the bottom left is MSR1. All of them are increased, mostly in the granulocytic MDSEs, but also in the monocytic MDSEs. And this is important because it brings us back full circle to a previous observation. Next slide. That observation was done by another young investigator uh, who was in our group that did a study of the tumor microenvironment and did a lipidomic study and found that there was a very a plethora of different lipids that were highly increased um, in the tumor microenvironment. One of them being LDL, cholesterol. Next slide. He also found that if he isolated these granulocytic MDSEs from the tumors in your left-hand side figure, they were not using and incorporating glucose as they normally do. They were instead incorporating very high levels of lipids. Not only was that happening in mice, in granulocytic MDSEs obtained from mice, but on the right-hand side, you also saw that if you isolated these MDSEs from patients, it was the same observation. Next slide. Furthermore, if one looked at the expression of enzymes associated with fatty acid beta oxidation, 
these MDSCs that were infiltrating the tumors of, these were human tumors, colonic carcinoma. And these MDSCs were now expressing enzymes that were necessary for, the, for fatty acid beta oxidation. Furthermore, the isolation of these MDSCs from those tumors, they, what, what Dr. Altami found was that they were now very highly immunosuppressive and expressing arginase 1. So based on these observations, next slide, Dr. Sanchez took MDSCs that she generated from normal bone marrows, added LDL into the culture, and as you can see they're labeled in red, these MDSCs took up cholesterol very rapidly. Not only did they take up cholesterol, but as shown in the right-hand side of this slide, they started now expressing arginase 1, as shown under the LDL stimulation, and this expression of arginase 1 was mediated through PPAR gamma. If you added a PPAR gamma inhibitor, you prevented partially, almost completely, the expression of arginase 1. Next slide. The other more important observation that she made from this work was that she did transcriptomic analysis of purified MDSCs isolated from these individuals. It was clear that in the right-hand side, there was differences between the non-obese controls and the obese patients on the right-hand side. That, that was clearly different. But what was even more interesting was the fact that one could probably divide obese individuals into two groups, those with high numbers of MDSCs and those with normal or low numbers of MDSCs, suggesting that there might be a way to classify obese individuals into, quote, inflamed obesity versus non-inflamed obesity. Now, whether this is related to the development of cancer or other diseases associated with inflammation is, an, is, is unclear from this study. Obviously, this study was not aimed at that, but clearly this provides some um, indications that there might be better ways of classifying obesity in terms of its association with inflammation. She is now undergoing, she's now going through all of this data, undergoing bioinformatic analysis, and, and I think the, the data is going to show some very interesting results. Next slide. So I think the conclusion from this we, it, it's very clear. Obesity does not create immunosuppressive MDSCs, but it does prepare cells to become um, highly receptive to the lipids present in the tumor microenvironment. And I just mentioned the possibility that transcriptome might allow us to identify those individuals that might be at a higher risk of developing uh, inflammatory associated diseases such as cancer. However, if one thinks that this is the end of the research, I think this is really just the tip of the iceberg because although obesity clearly is associated with the increase in risk in cancer in 14 different types of cancer, there's also certain paradoxes. There's a par one of the more important ones, I think, is the fact that even though these MDSCs appear to be increased in obese patients, the data is starting to show that obese patients have better outcomes when one treats them with immunotherapy, and this is particularly true in patients with lung cancer and kidney cancer. So this is fruitful areas for research. Next slide. Let me end the next slide. Let me end by showing something that um, John mentioned at the beginning, and that is the association of obesity with severe COVID disease. As you can see here, we looked at MDSCs in severe COVID disease, most of which are obese individuals, and the numbers of MDSCs is tremendously high. Next slide. They're not only in circulation, but they're also infiltrating the lungs of patients who die of COVID-19 COVID uh, complications. And you can see that these cells are actively producing arginase 1. And I'll just leave it there uh, and, and open this for uh, discussion and questions. Thank you, John, and thank you, Anil. Thank you, Dr. Ochoa. That was fantastic. Um, if we can have all the panelists uh, put their cameras on, that would be great. We have several questions coming in. Um, I, uh, Dr. Miele, can you turn your camera on, please? Thank you. Um, uh, may I also give a starter a question? Um, you know, and this, and I'll, I'll open this up to all the panelists. Um, um, if BMI is not a predictor, and, and I think some, I think Dr. Miele showed, you know, age and stage and a few things. If BMI is not the predictor, what 
aspect of obesity or and or inflammation could be a predictive marker. That's just a starter thing. I'll float that to any one of you who wants to answer that. Uh, in, in my opinion, we need to look at laboratory parameters. Uh, there is something called the Edmonton Obesity Staging Scale, uh, which includes a lot of other data elements that some of which can be derived from EHR. Uh, we actually have written code to calculate it. Uh, it's a lot more laborious than simply measuring people, but it tells you whether somebody has elevated hemoglobin H1C, whether somebody's hyperinsulinemic as, as defined by a diagnosis of uh, prediabetes. Uh, you can pull out the, the, the labs that let you determine whether somebody has metabolic syndrome. We've got to look at the clinical chemistry as a minimum, in addition to just body mass. Yeah, so more, so more of a general ideation versus a specific. Uh, Victoria, I think you, you were going to say something. Yeah, no, I, I agree with Dr. Emile very strongly here. I, I think we need more studies. And I think that we need studies that look more at the whole person. And I think as all of our speakers have, have alluded to, this makes it a much more difficult study to get. But I think, you know, really understanding individuals rather than generalizations is going to be key to really starting to look at what predicts, um, like as Dr. Ochoa was saying, tissue inflammation. And the, <laughs> just looking at BMI alone is really not giving us the entire picture. Yeah, I hear you. So, uh, uh, the, one of the questions related to this is, um, uh, this is more for uh, Dr. Siwat. There's such a good point that you mentioned significant individual variability and in insulin resistance. Asians come to mind particularly. Is there? Can you tell us a little bit about uh, any difference with Asians? Oh yeah, and this is really important in Los Angeles. In LA, we have people who are sixth and even seventh generation American who came originally from China, particularly. And as individuals have adopted Western diets, uh, their BMIs have increased proportionally. It's really easy to get fooled because you see somebody who has who's Asian and has a BMI of you know 22, 23. And if you think about a Northern European centric view, you go, oh, this is all perfect. But actually, these individuals have a very high likelihood, particularly if they're in their 50s or 60s, of being diabetic. So it's very important to check. This is not just true for individuals who are Asian, but people who are from um, India, for example, or the Middle East, um, or the Philippines. So uh, most of the world's um, insulin sensitivity and metabolic dysfunction is not captured by a, a Northern European centric viewpoint. Yeah, I, I agree. I've been, for instance, to China and I've seen these people in normal BI and they got diabetes, so it's pretty amazing. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Choa uh, from uh, 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 a contributor. So, um, you know, bariatric surgery, you, you described some of the changes with bariatric surgery, which was fantastic with inflammation. Um, and this person writes, you know, sometimes that's the only hope for pe people losing weight. I was wondering, related to that, um, would the same findings be found, for instance, if you use some of the uh, other aspects of bariatric control, such as like duodenal sleeves and these other things that don't necessarily require surgery or, you know, gastric balloons and all these others. So do, do you get a similar uh, in a similar vein, find some of the same findings if that's if that's been established. I, I don't I don't think that's that this particular aspect of it has been studied. What what we do know, however, and this is from a study done in adolescent uh, girls uh, who were working on um, through dietary and exercise weight loss. Uh, that was done by Dr. Sabaleta, and and they were studying asthma. They were not studying cancer. They did find that there were some significant changes and decreases in the number of inflama chronic inflammatory cells in the circulation of young girls who achieved significant weight loss uh, 
and control mm -hmm. of metabolic uh, aspects of it. Now, I understand, and 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 I think Dr. Seawalt has been doing some similar work with patients with breast cancer, and she might uh, shed some light on this. But but I don't think that we have gotten to the point where we look at different types of gastro gastric interventions to really ask, answer that question yet. Okay, Victoria, anything to add to that or no? Um, I think we don't have the data that Dr. Ochoa would like us to have. Um, we have been looking at women who start on metformin and see if we're able to, if we're able to reverse their prediabetes and insulin resistance, whether we're able to see a decrease in the inflammatory score in their breast aspirates. Um, we haven't finished collecting all our data, so I can't comment, but I'm hoping that we can get this data soon for Dr. Ochoa, and I I'm excited hearing his talk. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so this is for uh, uh, Dr. Miele, but um, maybe others can answer. What within strata of age at diagnosis and disease status is BMI a predictor of survival? In other words, could BMI be a predictor in certain subgroups? Uh, our analysis, that didn't seem to be the case, but there may not have been enough statistical power. Uh, because once you start breaking down even a large data set into multiple categories, you start losing statistical power. That's that's a, a question that's very uh, worthwhile, and I think we should investigate it, particularly in younger patients. Because again, as I said earlier, screening is not going to correct that disparity. Uh, these are people who are 30, and in some cases that, that I've personally uh, uh, witnessed 28, uh, they are not going to be eligible for mammography, so we do need to know whether in that age group there, there are uh, the predisposing factors tied to body mass uh, that can tell us to start screening much earlier or do something different. Yes, I agree. Um, you know, um, I alluded to in my comments, and I think two or three of you alluded to about the socioeconomics uh, and then how that uh, can can um, eventually drive disease and then relate to even COVID. Um, uh, a person writes, is this primarily epigenetically driven or do we know? I don't know anyone who can answer that one. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about epigenetics and then I think I'm gonna need some friends, help from my yes. friends. Um, one thing that is known about um, insulin and insulin production and glucose is that you drive the mitochondria quite hard and you can produce acetyl-CoA. And so normally you have DNA wound around your histones, but mm -hmm. if you have high production of acetyl-CoA, what that does is it binds to the lysines, which are positively charged and help to keep the DNA wound on the histones. And this results in inappropriate transcription. Um, there's also other impacts on DNA on DNA methylation as well. In women, in people with type one diabetes, um, Rama Natarajan from City of Hope found that these epigenetic changes are permanent and they cannot be reversed. And she called that epigenetic memory. The question I think for all of us to look at here is since you can reverse insulin resistance and you can impact prediabetes, are you able to start to reverse some of these epigenetic changes that might drive immune um, dysfunction, tissue inflammation? Now I'm gonna turn it over to my friends next. <laughs> uh, 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 everybody's familiar with the famous study of Pima Indians in, in Arizona and Mexico that was, it was an NIH study. Uh, uh, to which uh, investigators that are now at uh, Pennington uh, Biomedical Research Center participated, people hunted for the genes responsible for the dramatic difference in obesity and diabetes between north and south of the border and found nothing. Uh, and eventually, it turned out that this is a very genetically homogeneous population. The difference was epigenetic and inheritable 
uh, it, 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 that's the scary part. Mm -hmm. uh, so imprinting. Yes. Exactly. So, so, so I think I think there's a there's a whole set of literature that we that we call in immunology the training of myeloid cells, and that is all epigenetics. And I think there's a, an increasing body of literature showing how dietary aspects uh, cause training of these myeloid cells so that once they encounter a second signal, they become highly inflammatory or they become highly immunosuppressive. It depends on the type of cell that 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 is uh, stimulated. But I think, um, as uh, Vicky mentioned early on, and I think you did also, John, I think we still have very blunt instruments to understand what's happening and we really need to dive more and use finer tweezers to pick this apart so we can understand what are the markers, what the biology of what's happening here. There's a recent publication by Marsha Hager's group from Harvard, very good publication showing epigenetic changes in T cells uh, in an obese tumor microenvironment in mice. Yes. And, I, and I do think that these are the kinds of uh, pieces of information that will help us better dissect and draw the picture, which will then allow us to identify those at high risk and those at lower risk, even though they might have the same BMI. So, so I, there's several, oh, I'm sorry, you're gonna add, add something? No. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, as I look through the questions, I, I'm gonna throw out one myself, and this is more for Dr. Ochoa a little bit. Um, it, you know, we were just talking about epigenetics, and one of the most famous epigenetics is microsatellite unstable colon cancer. And I was wondering, is there a difference in the MDSC patterns for microsatellite unstable versus microsatellite stable, um, unstable versus stable colon cancer? And that's a big thing on in the world of oncology right now. So I was wondering if you could, you know, give light if there's any differences or if you studied that. Uh, we have not. Um, we have we have tried to do some uh, associated studies because we have a large population of young men in some areas of Louisiana who develop uh, early colon cancer at an early age. However, um, I don't have the data for that particular question, which I think is a very interesting question. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, some more questions for the whole panel. Along the lines of BMI, should the Field be moving towards using DEXA scans as a more accurate predictor of a person's health or adiposity. Uh, maybe this measurement will allow researchers to increase the resolution of our experimental approaches. I mean, is DEXA scan a good way? Well, I think that I got to harken back to all of our breast cancer trials. And while I think people haven't specifically used DEXA scans, they've used waist hip measurements. And even using waist hip measurements, uh, the results have been just hopelessly muddled and counterintuitive. So I think while it's very reasonable to look in more detail at the distribution of um, the fat and look, as I think Dr. Ochoa said, with finer tweezers, I think we also have to really look at biomarkers and particularly tissue-based uh, biomarkers. Okay. Anyone else want to add to that or no? No, I totally agree with that. Okay. Someone else asked again, looking for markers. Could HOMA IR, which is the homeostatic model assessment for insulin resistance, if I remember right, um, uh, could that be used instead of uh, BMI? Yes, and and we're using that currently in our uh, alliance trial. But I think, you know, as the other panelists have alluded to. We're only scratching the surface, right. and I think we really, you know, like with Dr. Ochoa's uh, example of people with inflamed, um, who with inflamed um, fat, with uh, versus people who have high BMIs uh, and not inflamed fat. We still need to really think deeper than we're doing. Yeah. I, I think I think the other the other aspect of this is is I think you know murine models of obesity. Are very important and give us some clues and give us some tools to work with. But I think there's nothing that can replace the information that we can glean from our patient studies. 
uh, and not not just patients with cancer, but but just obese individuals versus lean individuals, and maybe obese individuals with pre-malignant disease, which I think might give us a better tool, a better understanding of what's happening. I, I'd just like to make a pitch here for the importance of improved health care, and I think in Louisiana, with the adoption of the Affordable Care Act, they've really made an impact on the health of, of their state. But what happens is for a lot of women, there's fragmented health care that a woman goes in for her pregnancy care. She may gain some weight. She may be have gestational diabetes. And then she, in many places, she doesn't have the health care coverage to go and deal with the pre-diabetes or insulin resistance that might have occurred and then she has another pregnancy and more problems and mm. i think it really argues for early and consistent health care because 45 percent of diabetes can be prevented with the use of just general exercise a reasonable diet and the addition of metformin and this is one of our best trials but yet we just sit there as interns and wait until people become diabetic and say, yeah, oh, gee, yeah. let's go give them insulin. Yeah. Well, and, and, and when patients present to, to oncologists uh, with this metabolism or diabetes or obesity, uh, we don't do much about it. Maybe we refer them to an endocrinologist or maybe not. Uh, some of us are terrified of even talking about issues of weight with patients because that's a little sensitive. As as you said, you know, we don't want to give the impression that this is a, a matter of willpower or we're blaming patients for gaining weight, but we do have to emphasize that gaining weight is not healthy uh, and that it's biology and it can and, and should be corrected. Uh, that that's, should become part of oncology. What, one, um, uh, thank you. Uh, one person uh, writes, you know, we, we talked about, you know, poor diets and poor neighborhoods and socioeconomic status. Uh, one person writes, because this is probably a common thing, um, uh, is uh, what's the big component driving this uh, in terms of the diet? And so they write, is it the potential of high fructose corn syrup as um, you know, a component to Western diets, or is it more than that? So we have a community-based intervention trial that uses education um, and a little bit of exercise. And it's primarily focused on Latinas and it's run by our Latina promotores. And what it does is it teaches people to to shop on the outside of the supermarket. So on the inside, you've got all the junk food and all the crud. Yes. Yes. On the outside, you got the good stuff. You got the right. vegetables and and stuff like that. And just with very simple interventions, just a little bit of community based um, exercise and shopping on the outside and some res and recipe competitions, it's been the intervention has been really successful in reversing um, insulin resistance and prediabetes. So I, I think part of it is it's the stuff in the inside of our supermarkets that's really causing us a lot of problems. And, you know, unfortunately in a lot of neighborhoods, we just have, you know, tiendas and things like that, that just, ha they have all the stuff in the inside and nothing on the outside. Agree. So, yeah, so I think, it, you know, it's, so some people say calories in, calories out, but sometimes the type of calories that you put in are not the best thing. You know, I, I had a question, and then this is a related question from the audience as well. Um, uh, what can uh, drugs like anti-inflammatory strategies reduce the risk of cancer and or treat cancer? So that's a complicated one because there are different classes of these drugs, not all of which have the same effects. Some of them have anti-cancer effects that are off target. They're not actually mediated by COX inhibition. That said, uh, that is a field that should be investigated. 
And the last time I gave a talk about this uh, to our, our friends at the Mayo Clinic, what I heard was, oh, that's fantastic, but no one's ever going to want to fund this kind of study because there's no new medication here. <laughs> that's, that's part of our existence, right? <laughs> but but I, I do think I do think that there is a push, uh, both at the NCI and other places, for um, repurposing drugs that we already have. We already have thousands of drugs that are approved for other indications, and 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 we've just again, it's in a, in some ways scratched the surface of their use. Um, there is work from one of our investigators here, Dr. Ya Wan Chi, looking at an old anti-inflammatory Sulindac and mm -hmm. looking at it at a much more precise way. And he has been able to show that Sulindac itself inhibits not only the inf inflammatory, chronic inflammatory MDSCs, but also modulates the expression of PDL1 and therefore increases the efficacy of immunotherapy. So I think there's ways of exploring this, um, presenting this in a really strong with a really strong scientific basis. And although inflammation, anti-inflammatories themselves are not the answer to obesity, um, I, I think certainly in diseases that are more associated with chronic inflammation, and not all cancers are associated with chronic inflammation. Um, that that they might might uh, work. And no, I, I, uh, uh, prostaglandin E2, which is uh, the target of many NSAIDs, is one of the most potent immune suppressants. Uh, it, it it blocks T cell activation. So there, there there is a mechanistic reason for thinking that we just have to go in in much deeper detail, as Augusto was saying earlier. Uh, deciding which class of drug and which member of which class of drug works better, uh, but repurposing is the key. Yeah, I, I would agree. I know in some of the hereditary syndromes, like Lynch syndrome, the the CAP two study shows you know high dose aspirin can reduce that. Um, and there's been some other studies looking at elderly populations in aspirin, and 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 in this case. You know that Australian study showed that there was more cancers, so it is a complicated uh, thing. You know we're at 4:29. I think um, there's a number of other questions, but we'll have to answer those um, by writing and responding back. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wally for closing remarks. Thank you, Dr. Carruthers, and thank you each and every one of you. The, it was just illuminating presentation. And uh, by noticing the participants are still more than 250. So this was really, um, you addressed all of the questions essentially. I think we hardly left a couple of them behind, but it was really educational and informational uh, webinar. So I would like to urge our um, attendees to attend the next two uh, webinars on the series uh, where on March 18th and March 25th, uh, where we would discuss the clinical research aspects as well as the population community-based research regarding uh, obesity, uh, cancer, and cancer health disparities. So with that, uh, one more uh, uh, request to all the participants. Please respond to the um, survey that would be sent uh, as a thank you email from our organizers. We would really appreciate if we could uh, if you could fill that questionnaire. It would help us uh, in designing future webinar series. Thank you, thank you, each and every one of you. Thank you so very much. And thank you for hosting this, Dr. Wally. Thank you, Mark. Yes, thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much.